And welcome to the 19th meeting in 2015 of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. Remind uh, those uh, around the table and also those in uh, the, uh, uh, the gallery that uh, your mobile phones should be switched off, uh, or at least in silent. They can interfere with the broadcasting system. You'll notice that some members are using tablets during the meeting, uh, which provides them with the papers in digital format. We have apologies from Jim Hume today and welcome Alison McInnes, MSP, to the committee this morning in his place. Uh, agenda item one is, uh, the, uh, is to consider whether to take uh, item three in private. Uh, that's uh, on your agenda just now. Are members agreed? Yeah, agreed? We are, thank you. So agenda item two is about first milk. And the second item today is to take oral evidence on the impact of the first milk turnaround plan announced on the 1st of May this year. And I welcome the witnesses to the meeting, Mike Gallagher, uh, CEO of First Milk, and Jim Baird, uh, the Scottish Director of First Milk. And uh, I open up to questions. First of all, uh, I would ask you, gentlemen, if you could give us an idea, particularly Mike Gallagher, you know, what did you find when you came in to take over uh, this company? Uh, what was the state of affairs? What was your prognosis at that time? Um, yes, well, well, good morning, everybody. Um, I've been enrolled for about uh, eight weeks now, um, and uh, clearly the first few weeks were to get a rapid assessment of the state of the, of the business. Uh, of course, the first thing, I'm, I'm new to the dairy category. The first thing that struck me was quite how difficult the category was. Now, you know, I've been an outside observer working in different parts of, of business, um, but clearly dairy is going through a perfect storm in terms of a number of factors hitting at the same time. Um, so, and I think you will be more familiar with them than I am. You know, the situation in Russia, the situation in China, the global prices, the quotas being lifted, uh, let alone some of the retail pressures in, in the UK, have amounted to a significant pressure across the board in, in dairy businesses. Um, it's evident, of course, that is having its impact. Um, we've seen the impact of profitability of some of the companies, and we've also seen the consolidation that's going on to deal with those pressures in the industry. So certainly the first thing that struck me was quite how difficult um, the competitive environment is. Um, in terms of First Milk, obviously a, a business that's had a turbulent recent uh, period, um, a business that um, is struggling, uh, has struggled financially and also struggled to deliver a good price to its, uh, its members, which of course is, is unacceptable. Um, I think you know, there's elements of strategy and, and uh, uh, and focus, uh, I think I've been very clear. Uh, my view has been there's a, a need for us to focus back on our core business. Uh, there's been a lot of, uh, of time spent on smaller other parts of the business. Um, so that was an issue I saw. And also we had some uh, costs that we needed to attack and deal with. Um, sadly, that has an impact on, on people. But in order to deliver a decent price to our uh, members, we have to keep our costs under control. Um, so a, a series of issues that I found when I, I joined the company and obviously an absolute imperative to move very fast uh, because in this situation, when I've been in this situation before, you, you have to move fast. You don't have a lot of time and you have to make progress. You say the smaller parts of the business. What does that include? Yeah, well, I, I think um, uh, the business had a, a, a strategy which I think directionally is, is very sound, which is and very common, which is uh, to get into areas that are more premium. When you're in a, a tough, commoditized, highly competitive core business, then going into areas where you can make a bit more, bit more money, particularly if they're high growth, high margin areas, is, is a very sound direction. Uh, we had made some steps in that direction um, with a number of businesses, um, but those businesses were not yet delivering, um, were not yet accretive to the financial performance of the business. They were dilutive to the financial performance of the business. Um, and, and I think some of those businesses don't include a, a business called CNP, a sports nutrition business, um, which is not related to milk. So it doesn't, it is related to milk in terms of some of its raw materials, but doesn't take milk from first milk. Um, so that's one of the examples. I see. And uh, then you commented on costs. Um, and I think we'll just explore some of these in detail. Uh, who wants to come in next? Questions from members? Graham Day. 
I, th thank you. Good morning. I, I just wonder, in terms of the plan to take the business forward, obviously your members, the rank and file farmers, are very much feeling the pain. What other steps are being taken to reduce overheads across the business? I mean, I'm thinking of areas like directors' remunerations, you know, staffing centrally. Yeah, I think uh, I think some action had been taken prior to, to my arrival, so I wouldn't say there's no there's been no focus on that. There's been some difficult choices made already in the business. Um, uh, I think the um, w when we looked at it uh, as a board when I arrived, uh, you know, the reality is you have to maintain a certain uh, overhead structure. Um, so as the business has has changed in in size, and as our costs have developed, we ha we've have to address that. Um, where that's fallen at the moment, it's across across the board. Elements of it are clearly are confidential in terms of who's directly impacted. We're still finishing the, the consultation program, so it's not yet finished. Um, but it will be uh, it'll be widespread across different levels of the business. And at director level, I mean, yes. it plans to reduce the number of directors or the remunerations, that sort of thing. Uh, I can't really. I mean, I think I've answered it in saying it's it's hitting every level of the business. Okay. Okay. Um, First of all, Sarah Boyack asked to speak, and then Mike Russell. Thanks very much, Convener. Uh, good morning. Um, in the brief we've got for today that looks at the industry, and we, we did the milk inquiry um, a couple of months ago, a, a key issue that kept coming up was the issue of milk prices. And one of the things that's really striking about First Milk um, is just how low it is in the ranking of price paid to producers. I'm wondering what your general comment is on that and what the scope for upping that is because it's obviously a very competitive market but at the producer end we spent a lot of time discussing how people could reduce their costs but to be right at the bottom of that is obviously creating a huge issue for people who supply you going forward. Uh, so first in terms of our position so my, my view is I mean the first question I had from our farmer members was why is our milk price where it is? Um, and uh, you know, I've been I've been around the country. I've talked to 600 farmers face to face in the last uh, two weeks and, and shared my conclusions on on that. Um, I've just I've just given you some idea. You know, there's there's cost issues there. There's been some performance issues in the business, and there's been, as I said, subsidiaries that have not been um, delivering. So a a basket of of issues. Uh, it is fair to say I think that going back, that's not always been the case. It's also fair to say that some of our contracts pay up in the upper quartile. So you'll see that some of the contracts that we have um, do pay better. Um, uh, but you know, I'm not happy with, wh with where we are, and we need to do a better job, and we need to do it fast, uh, particularly with the market as it is. Could I just come in there? Because you know, traditionally, we've had uh, part of the business model was based on brokering to, to predominantly liquid players. And, and that part of the business had declined, uh, and particularly in the last 12 to 18 months. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, and that has left us exposed more to the commodity markets and, and that we've had to put a lot of milk down to a drying plant down at, down at Westbury. And, uh, and that has been exacerbated by the fact that there's been a lot more milk produced in the last 12 months, uh, which is why there's such a supply, you know, uh, demand imbalance at the moment. And, and so we are more exposed to that commodity end of the market than, than other players in the UK. Uh, and uh, to some extent, we find ourselves balancing the, all, the whole, almost the whole UK market, uh, which is, is not exactly where you want to be when the commodity market is where it is at this moment in time. Are we talking about uh, milk from Scotland going to Westbury, is it? Effectively, there is an excess of, of milk in, in Scotland, which has to be effectively... It doesn't go straight to Westbury, obviously, but it's shuttled down the country, you know, so there's a net cost to, to transport. There's a net migration of milk down the country. Matt. Sorry, Sarah, did you want to? Yeah, I suppose I was just thinking about um, one of the things we looked at in our inquiry um, was about basically local um, demand and what opportunities are there to increase local demand in Scotland? You say we're producing too much milk, but uh, one of the things we were discussing was issues related to um, milk products, not just liquid milk. So what is the scope for doing more in terms of um, yogurts is the one that everybody mentioned that we're not doing enough of in Scotland. Butter, cheese, what are the opportunities for a company like First Milk to try and get into those markets? Um, I'll give some, maybe Jim would add to this. I mean, just to finish off your earlier point, you talked about getting the milk price up. Um, clearly some of the announcements we've had, as I've gone around and, and spoken to large groups of farmers, I've been able to explain the impact of our 
cost reductions have a direct correlation to milk price, so I'm able to quantify that. Um, similarly, with other changes in the business, we're able to say this is worth 0.4 pence, this is worth 0.2 pence, and that we're working to deliver it as fast as possible. In, t in terms of the other half of the equation, which is adding value uh, to milk, clearly that's a big focus. There's lots of ways of doing that in terms of the mix of the products that you deliver, be it cheese, soft cheese, um, yogurts, uh, SMP. So getting that mix is clearly part of both balancing your risk in the business and also maximising returns. Um, the opportunities internationally are obviously there, um, and the opportunities for, for brands are there. Uh, what I would say is that the board has uh, kicked off a review of our strategy. So as we started on the turnaround plan, obviously as a board, we also said we need to review our strategy. That process is probably uh, a bit less than halfway through, halfway through um, and in the coming months we will conclude that strategy review. Uh, in time, effectively, uh, as we complete our turnaround and cost reduction program, we'll be ready uh, so that we can, uh, you know, validate our existing strategy. So that work is is ongoing. Thanks. Okay, Mike Russell. I want to, in time, focus down on the situation in Butte because I think that's particularly serious. But just on the point that Graham Day raised with you about overall costs in the business, you said that you were looking at the overall costs of the board and directorships, but that that was a confidential matter? In as far as it impacts individual people, uh, mm. I, I think... I mean, I think we are, we are looking at how we can reduce costs in the board and whether it's our remuneration or whether it's number of board. We are looking at every aspect of, 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 of the business. In front of me, Jim, Jim Pace's de uh, declaration of interest in the House of Commons in March 2015, which shows that he gets paid between £85,000 and £90,000 a year to chair the company. Given the difficulties of the company over the last year, is that a fair remuneration? Uh, uh, so you're asking me to comment on the remuneration of the chairman of my board. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know what you expect me to well, say. Well, I'm simply making the point that that is you know, in, on the public record uh, yeah, well, and is you know, a, a matter of concern to some of your members yeah, who have raised it with me. I, I, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I've been... You know, it, it, the COP is a, it's a democratic organisation. Um, that salary is agreed democratically within the structures of okay. the organisation, and it's uh, externally validated. So you know, I, I, I don't know what else we can say. I mean, I, you know, my position is I want to support First Milk to succeed, um, and I think you, know, you have come in as a, a new broom, and the new broom was very much required. But new brooms sometimes have to, sometimes have to clear out uh, things that require to be cleared out. And I think, you know, we'll come to prices later on. But, you know, when you have um, individual farmers who are getting less than that for a month's work of producing milk, they find it difficult to understand. To be blunt. I understand. Okay. Yeah, Graham. Yeah, thank you, Convener. Just to, this may seem a simplistic question, but I just want to get a handle on, on what's happening here. You, you have a plan... You're presumably in your conversations with your members, telling them where you think you might be in six months' time, 12 months' time, two years' time. So in hard figures, what sort of milk price do you envisage the company paying six months from now, a year from now? Uh, what, I've, what I've been doing is, is showing them where I see the opportunities and how that equates in terms of milk price. So you know, we reduce the cost in the business by X, and this equates to this amount on the, on the average price per litre. But clearly, uh, you know, it would be foolish for me to sit here and comment on where I expect milk prices to be in six months. Uh, we've just seen, you know, every day I get updates from what's happening around the world. Uh, the update I saw yesterday was, you know, from New Zealand to Europe to Ireland, uh, people making announcements about milk prices that are in the region of 19.5p. Uh, and these are big organisations, big dairy organisations. I cannot forecast where the market is going to go. Um, so it'd be foolish for me to stand here saying, you know, and, and, and say where it's going to be in six months. I asked the question because I'm sure your members are asking this question yeah. because some of them are faced with going out of business, so they're having to make tough decisions about whether to remain in the sector or not. I mean, what hope can you offer them that things will be better even in six months' time, a year's time? Well, I mean, I can only speak a farmer who's in exactly the position that you, you talk about, you know, and and you know that. The, the, what we're getting from milk at this moment doesn't cover the cost of production. For, there's no, you know, for for the vast majority of producers. And but it is, you know, we can't sit here and say what the, the milk price is going to be. You know, we are into a very volatile period for for the dairy industry, and and it, it seems to be that that it was predicted that's what it was going to do. I don't think any of us believed it would be as volatile as it has been. 
but that is a new reality of the world we live in, unfortunately. And and all of us, you know, all of us as producers have to really look at our businesses and and see where we can shave costs. Obviously, we can't shave them to the extent that that the, the milk prices come back. But you know, that's the reality we're in now, and, and we have to to to. And some of us will have to decide whether the future is in dairy for us. That you know, and that's a very valid question for all of us to ask. But uh, but we can't sit here and say that the milk price will be. 25p in, in six months' time. Uh, what, what does strike me is that, as someone new to the category, is uh, you know, in, uh, and in the conversations I've had over the last two weeks around around the country with, as I said, 600 farmers, um, very frank discussions, uh, both in large meetings and afterwards uh, one to one, uh, is that there is uh, an awareness that this thing is cyclical. Is cyclical. Okay, so we this is now our third cycle, I think, since 2007. It's uh, it's deeper and higher. You know, the the, uh, the gap is bigger than it was last time. But it will get better. Now, that's what I'm hearing from farmers. Right? They sit there saying, you know, Mike, this is going to get better. What we can't do, and I think if you look at all the best forecasts around, around the world, you'll, you'll see a consistent message that there is significant uncertainty in the medium term. Mm. We'll move from Alec Ferguson to Mike Russell to Angus MacDonald. Yeah, I was just on the subject of pricing convenience. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, it was just, I wonder if you, since April, you have sort of changed the range of contracts you had and you now operate an A and B pricing structure. And I just wondered for the record if you could just explain that a little bit more, how that operates, um, what, what constitutes being in the A price and the B price and whether there is likely to be much movement between the A and B prices. Yeah, well, the basis for the A and B, were, were, we, we based it on the last two years' production and we said that your A, your a volume was 80% was of your last two years' production. Uh, and, and the idea is that the, the A price will be a, on a steadier plane uh, and be more predictable, and the B price will be more determined by uh, what we get from, you know, uh, more like the commodity markets, uh, as it were. Um, but it gives us, you know, there's no question we ran into difficulties last year because we, we, we weren't responsive enough to, to the market, and, and the market ran away from us, and, and we just really never caught up. And that was where some of our difficulties came from. And this gives us some levers that, that we, 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 can, we can play with, uh, and it uh, gives us, you know, uh, but we, you know, if people have got an A price at 80%, they, they can produce to that, and if they don't fancy producing B litres at whatever B litres are, well, that's fine. And, it, and the B price could go higher than the A price if the commodity, you know, and, and then that gives them a strong market signal that, well, you, you want to produce a lot of milk here, guys, if you, if you want, if you can. And uh, so, it, you know, it gives us a bit more flexibility than we, we, we've previously had. Um, but just for absolute clarity, the 80% the figure, that is fixed, is it? It's not fixed, but it's, it's, it will move on a, on a smoother plane than, than, the, than the, the, the B. We, we, we set the, the A price ahead. Sorry, yeah, sorry, it's fixed I, in that sorry, regard, I, yes. sorry I, I didn't mean the price that you're giving for the A price. I, I meant Volume, the 80% yes. the figure that yes. will be paid the A price. That yes, is fixed. Yes, that is fixed. Yeah, yeah. That's, on, an that's, annual, on an annual basis. That's, that's what I wanted to say. Rolling two, yeah. over your last two, rolling uh, yes. 48 months, as it were, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mike Russell. Yeah, I think it's quite important to put this. I mean, somehow there's got to be a way found of ensuring that those people like you, Jim, who are producing milk, are able to do so because it's not sustainable to produce a, a product even in the medium term without recovering the cost of production. That's simply a, a, bit, a bit of reality. I think it is important for members of the committee to understand what this means precisely. And I've got in front of me two uh, milk invoices from your company, one from last April and one from this April. And they're both from the same producer in Butte. In last April, in April 2014, for 46,139 litres, that producer got £15,017.23. This year, for a very slightly smaller volume, 44,583 litres, the same producer got um, under just over £7,000 after retention. So that was more than half of that income gone. Now, interestingly, when I mentioned retention, the retention on the first end, most that's the money that the company holds on to. You would agree that that's a definition for whatever reason that's the money it holds on to. The retention last year was £145.94 on 15000 The retention this year um, on that much lower price was £1,190. Now, I I'm not criticising those figures, though they're horrific, but I really do think the question is, how do people survive in those circumstances? Because if the cost of production must be higher than the the A price on, on the, um, 
The milk there was 15.576 a litre, and the B price was 11.176 a litre. Now, you know, the cost of production, even with the best producers in the best circumstances, and on islands the cost of production will be higher, must, Jim, you would agree, be 23, 24 pence at, at minimum? Um, you know, yeah, you would agree? In that kind of ballpark. Yeah. yeah. So we have, you know, a farm, an identifiable farm there, you know, on Butte, which is losing that amount of money month after month. I have another constituent who's losing £200 each day at the present moment. Now, this isn't sustainable. Does the company expect to have suppliers in the Scottish milk fields, frankly, if that situation is, is sustained for more than the next few months? What's your projection on this? Uh, look, I mean, this isn't just a Scottish problem. It's, no, I'm not know, saying I, it is, this, but that's this the reality. This is a, a national, national problem right across the UK. I, and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and we have, I've had discussions with bank managers recently, and, and, and we all have to go and have a chat with a bank manager and see whether, you know, because we will need support through this, and there's no question. And as one of them put it, it's, it's, you almost need to make another investment in your business, and, and that is predicated on whether you think the future, there's going to be a, a you know, an upturn in the market. It's also been predicated on whether your own family situation, you know, have, have you got succession? You know, all these things have got to come into play. But yeah, I agree. It's not a sustainable situation at this moment in time. I, 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 Question, you know, for Mike, really, if you don't mind me asking this, is you know, what, in, what do you believe as a company is sustainable? Do you, how many suppliers would you expect to have in six months' time if this continues? I mean, there's a... There's a uh, an existential threat for dairy in the UK if this continues, of course. I mean, not, it won't just be us. It will be all the producers. We'll find that our farmers can't sustain themselves. That clearly is a significant a significant issue. Uh, to the extent that we're um, a, a bit away from that, um, you know, we do work regularly to look at contingency plans for our volumes and how that would affect our business. But I think you've stated the problem very, very clearly. This is exactly the issue we're dealing with. That's why we, to the extent that there are things within our control and things we can do, it's why we need to move very fast, and it's also why we need to work effectively together across all different agencies, with government, with local government, um, across different businesses working together to find best solutions possible. Okay. So you spoke to 600 farmers. How many of these were in uh, Butte, Aaron, Kintyre, Gia? Uh, my meetings, uh, obviously... Th at meetings across the country, um, Midlands, uh, Wales, um, Cumbria, uh, Central Scotland. Uh, I had meetings in um, uh, Kintyre and in uh, Butte over the last two weeks. Um, they've been, all of the farmers, pretty much 100% attendance at those meetings uh, and with other people from other uh, agencies. So we've had the, the Scottish NFU at those meetings, local estates at the meetings, um, and I have to say they've been very productive. I mean, it's not good news. I've been sharing stuff about the business which you know, we're not happy, happy with, uh, but the focus is what we are going to do as a business and what we're going to do to, uh, together uh, as a cooperative to get the position better. Yeah, um, Angus McDonald, then Claudia Beamish. Yeah, thanks, um, convener. Uh, taking the, the, the price issue a bit further, and particularly the, the, the global price, um, you mentioned earlier that uh, from, I think, from New Zealand to Europe to Ireland, it was sitting around about 19 and a half pence. Um, now, I'm curious as to whether realistically there's any prospect of um, an EU intervention price uh, being, in being introduced, albeit uh, uh, temporarily, and whether you've lobbied uh, DEFRA on that point um, recently. I'm very conscious. I, I think I said to you at the beginning, I'm eight, eight weeks into this, and so my knowledge of the category in the dairy industry is, is not as great, I'm sure, as, as, as many of you. Uh, I understand there is an EU intervention floor and that we're getting close to that level. But is there any prospect of that uh, intervention price being increased, albeit temporarily? Not that, I, not that I'm aware of. Okay. Uh, Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Convener, and good morning to you both. Um, I, I'm actually a, a member of the court party, and uh, I, I'm in the parliamentary group of co cooperative um, members. Uh, I, I would like to ask you both um, uh, the significance of the fact that First Milk uh, is a cooperative, and what you see the strengths of that being, and um, 
if you could explain something of the engagement. We, we took evidence at the previous um, inquiry into, into, into the dairy industry uh, quite recently uh, and asked questions about um, the strength of producer organisations. And I wonder, I'm not going to put words in your mouth, either of you, but I wonder whether you see that as a strength and if so, what the strengths are going forward. I, so I, I can go first. I, I mean, I, I, it was one of the reasons I, I took the role. I, I, I see it as a potential strength. I, I think if you look empirically, it's not always been the case uh, for co-ops, particularly in the UK recently. We've seen a number of co-ops struggle uh, with, the, um, uh, with being successful businesses as well as being successful cooperatives. Um, I mean, for me, uh, benefits include the fact it's a, it's a democratic organisation. It's owned by the members. The members have a stake and they set the strategy uh, for the organisation. I think there are potentially some great strengths there. Um, we've announced that we're reviewing how we've done business in over the last um, a couple of years. Uh, and I think we quoted the miners' review of what's, what happened in the cooperative group. Um, so I think we share a view that there's probably some lessons we can learn about how to run a cooperative better um, to deliver a better uh, result for the members. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been a stalwart of cooperation you know, all, all my days. and, uh, and uh, But it... There's no question. It's a it's a challenge, you know, because you know we we do kind of fall prey to commercial organisations who want to cherry pick our best producers, uh, and uh, and and you know ultimately a cooperative has to be as commercial as commercially driven as, as any other business, and if if I'm honest, sometimes that's not not the easiest thing to do because you do find you you take in, uh, you know, as producers you you, you there's a natural instinct to. To be more socially aware, maybe than, than some of the commercial organisations, and then and that can leave us at disadvantage. And uh, through the convener, do you, do you see um, the fact that uh, do you see it as a strength in relation to anything to do with negotiating price or any any of those issues? You know, because because it's maybe got with more clout or not? with. No, it can be. It can be a good story, you know. It's, sometimes, you know, there, there can be an advantage to go with that story. But um, traditionally, the retailers are maybe not good enough at, at shouting that tune. You know, are are, are valuing it in, in terms of actually paying a premium for it. Uh, to, um. Thank you, Mike Russell, the Alec Ferguson. Surely, one of the strengths of a cooperative would be equity of treatment for all the members of the cooperative. Now, you know, I, I can understand the real pressures are on price. Nobody's disputing them. I can understand and, uh, in a sense, support um, some of the efforts you're making to, to turn the business around. But my sticking point, and, and Mike Gallagher knows this because we had a conversation this very morning before this meeting about it, uh, nothing secret about that in case anybody saw us talking. A, I am concerned at the lack of equity of treatment of the 13 producers on Butte who are receiving a penny a litre less as a result of the turnaround plan. That seems to be against the principles of the cooperative. Uh, a lot of good work has been done by a lot of people, including the company, the farmers, the estate, uh, and others, and the Scottish Government, to get a new dispensation for transportation for the next six months. That will uh, essentially reduce that difference to about three pence. Wouldn't it be in the spirit of the cooperative if, if the cooperative accepted that that one penny cut should now disappear before implementation so that there was an equity of treatment, at least you know, across Kintyre and, um, and Butte. I think, I think uh, Mike, you make, you make a couple of points. Um, of course, I'm new, to, I'm new to this role and, and to working in a cooperative organisation, uh, but I think what is very clear, and, and maybe there's a misconception about this, is this co-op for years has had different prices for different groups of, of farmers, and those, farmers that, that, those prices have been based, to a greater or lesser extent, on the value of that value of that milk. Um, and I've sought advice, you know, as I've gone into my uh, role, um, you know, I've, I've understood from others um, who have got expertise in the cooperative field that if you look across the world, that's not an established principle that everybody should get the same price for, regardless of the value of what they're producing, the commercial value. So I don't accept that principle. I do accept a principle of consistency of treatment. Um, and I think that's why, as we made these announcements about the new milk fields, um, a large number of people were adversely affected, a large number of farmers were adversely affected. And it was important that we applied some consistent principles across the organisations. Um, one, that's the right thing to do. Secondly, you know, we're accountable to our, our uh, farmers for the consistency of treatment. Um, 
And so that's why it's important that farmers on Butte are treated consistently with the 337 farmers in the Midlands, which we talked about this morning, who had the same impact um, from the changes. I would also stress this point, uh, and I, I've stressed this as I've gone around talking to farmers across the country, um, that in changing the way that we set prices to something that's based on value, so that the farmers have a line of sight either to the creamery or their customer, and therefore, in my view, can be more involved and engaged and hold people to account uh, for that performance. Um, but as we, as we make that change um, across, across the country, there will be some volatility in the prices. So we've announced it, and of course the impact is, when we've announced it, some prices have gone like this. Now, next month, given the volatility in the market, some volatility in the market, some of those prices could go like this, and the following month they could do this, and so there will be some changes. And so to the, to the extent that some have had a 0.2 increase, some have had a 1% decline, um, these are monthly numbers that will change. Uh, to the point about our discussion, you know, uh, you know, in as much as the focus should be about what are we going to do to help farmers, uh, there may be some implications around that in terms of farmers need to be able to deal with that volatility because you know, that's their life now. Um, is that hedging? Is that better advice financially on how they manage their businesses? That's certainly on our agenda in terms of how, how we can help. Sorry, Jim. Yeah. Can I just add a, another key point here is that, is that and this, if we're going to go down the route that we have, you know, is this requirement for transparency? You know, and, and, you know, and that's something that I know you guys have been critical of us as a business in terms of before. But that's an absolute must now. If we're going to pay people different prices based on different, we have to be accountable, as Mike says, for, for, for how that, that is, is worked out. And, you know, I have been chairing a working group in the Kintyre uh, out, out there. Uh, and, you know, with the last meeting we had with those guys, we put the, the, the profit and loss for that creamery up in front of them that night. And, and we're absolutely clear to them what would drive a price for them, what, what the issues were in terms of what we had to address. And, and, and it's all about getting buy-in, and, 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 and with the guys in Butte, we've been perfectly upfront about the, the cost of the haulage, and you know, and put that out there in terms of as a target to how can we how can we address that? So, uh, so you can reduce the cost of the haulage. You've had that demonstrated. The government has put in resource to support the cost of the haulage. The state is putting resource in. Uh, you know, I mean, Mike, I'm very keen to support the company in recovery. But the, as I said to you earlier, the sticking point for me is the unfairness in Butte. Yes. It seems to me that you are asking your members in Butte to, to, to pay the same to be members of the co-op because their retention has not been reduced by any percentage at all. But you, they, they, what they get out of that is the lowest of anybody in the co-op. Now, that is basically unfair and inequitable. Now, those farmers are stand an even bigger risk, and we've talked about the risk of going out of business anyway. They stand an even bigger risk because that is exacerbating their problem. Given, and I make the point again, and you know, clearly we're not going to agree on this, but I make the point because it's important. Given that that one pence difference has been substantially bridged by actions that have been taken by the Scottish government, by the state, and by others, and that there is still the potential for the company to save on haulage, then I think the company's intention to create an equity with Kintyre. Nobody's asking you to do anything else. That intention would be tremendously valuable in terms of goodwill towards the company going forward. As we've discussed before, I absolutely understand the strength of your, the strength of your view. Uh, we equally have, a, as a board, a very strong view that we need to treat all of our farmers across the country consistently, and that if we were going to treat this differently, uh, to treat the 337 farmers in the East Midlands, or even in principle all of the other farmers, who are getting a, value, a, a price based on the value, the commercial value of their milk, if we breach that principle, it would be very hard to stand up in front of any other stakeholder and talk about fairness and consistency. Now, to, to your point, I think what's been, well, you know, what I would welcome is that immediately this decision was made in the board. We set up task, task forces to address those issues. Uh, and those task forces were set up of farmer directors and members of the business and local uh, farmers. We've made significant progress in a number of areas about dealing with issues that are very long-standing. So the issue on Butte has been the case, as you know better than I, for five years. There's been effectively a, a, a hemorrhage of money in that organisation. Um, and I'm glad to say that the, the Scottish Government has helped enormously with the announcement that made yesterday. Uh, we've galvanised some action on logistics costs, which are now coming through, which will substantially close that gap. And actually, we've also galvanised um, the, local, the local group, the local farmers, 
uh, to develop a, a four-week action plan, a business development plan about other options for getting a sustainable, longer-term, higher price for that milk. Now, that's got to be a good thing. So it is about what we do about it, because as I said to you, I said to you earlier, these prices will be volatile and they will change month by month. And so this issue today in Butte could be in Wales tomorrow and could be somewhere else uh, the month later. No, just uh, to supplement that, you know, I mean, I, I'm too cooperative, you know, through, and that, these kind of things are difficult, you know, I, I don't underestimate that by any stretch of imagination, but a lot of these positive things that would have happened in the last few wouldn't have happened if we just kept going on and doing, doing the same as we've been doing forever. So sometimes you've got to really ask yourself, that, you know, can you keep doing the same thing? You'll just get the same result. And, you know, that's kind of where we are. We, we really have to think radically. And, uh, and the totally. The galvanising effect has been there. The, uh, the, the transportation costs issue has been forced, and I'm glad to do with that. This committee recommended it in its report. Other things have happened. What I'm saying is the company, if Mike is saying that he believes that this inequity, because that's what it is, will be resolved within a few weeks by other actions because there will be an improved price because the farmers are doing various other things, then that's a step in the right direction. But there is... I, I, didn't, I didn't say that. So I thought you were indicating I said the prices thought... will be volatile. I said what will happen is a 0.2 difference or a one penny difference here could go either way in the coming months. And these prices are adjusted every month depending on the value of that milk. And that value of that milk is volatile at the moment. So what I'm saying is we can argue today about this difference, but the differences could be different next month. And so the real well, issue we need to focus on is about how do we add value properly. And this issue on Butte has been the case for five years at least. And so what we need to do is say, how can we create more value with that milk for our farmers on a sustainable basis? And you will, well, I, I just put the fact on the record, I believe you should either reduce the retention to make a difference from that if you don't want to change the formula you've just set, or you should take other actions to take away that inequity, which I think is a barrier to the full and wholehearted support that many would like to give the company in its recovery. But this seems the wrong thing to have done. And indeed, its, its contribution to the financial problems you have is absolutely infinitesimal. But I, I, there we are. I, I, I appreciate we, we, you know, we've discussed this a lot over the last uh, couple of weeks. I, I would also point that we talked about the miners' review of the co-op. I think one of the, uh, and this has been established in a couple of reviews of, of cooperatives in, in the last year, is that businesses have, uh, cooperatives have not made the decisions that they've had to, uh, and they've, they've, uh, they've called it a values issue. In my view, this is not a values issue um, at all. Um, and this is a decision that had to be made, and to, to Jim's point, having made it, it means we get the energy directed to fix the long-term uh, problem. So I think this is one of the issues with cooperatives, is they haven't faced into some of the difficult decisions that needed to be, needed to be dealt with. Uh, first of all, uh, from Graham Day, and then Dave Thompson, and then... Thank you. Thank you. Can be up here. Yeah, I'd like to come at this from the, the direction of the public purse. Um, we've seen uh, the Scottish Government commit to invest in the Campbellton Creamery. We've heard the announcement yesterday of £65,000 to assist the farmers. I guess my question would be, how long do we have to wait until First Milk Scottish operation is standing on its own two feet? Or can we anticipate over the next six months, year, whatever, further approaches to the Scottish Government asking it to step in and support the Scottish farmers who are part of the First Milk Cooperative? Well, first, you know, I, I welcome the support that's come from the, the Scottish Government. I think some of these discussions have been going on a long time, um, and, it, and it's great to see that support. And I think the transportation um, uh, support has been requested by this committee. Indeed, it seems that we're now treating dairy consistently with other parts of agriculture across the Highlands and Islands. So I think that's a good thing. Um, I understand its impact on the public purse, but it's something that I think this committee has argued for. In terms of further help, I, I had a good uh, meeting with Richard uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we explained that uh, we were developing very fast business plans, detailed business plans, and that we would be coming to him with requests for more help. And that's not just financial, that's in terms of leadership and bringing people together, which I think the Scottish Government has also been doing very effectively. Um, and, and, and Richard welcomed that. So there will be more requests for help, and I think that's the right thing, because I think we need, we need to work together. Um, Dave Thompson. Thank you. Convener, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, I'm, I'm a wee bit uh, confused, and just like a wee bit of clarification on the on this price issue. Um, you, you, you mentioned that the price differential would be based on, I think, 
if, if I recollect what you said correctly, quality and value. Uh, but surely the one pence reduction on Butte, was that not stated to be because of the transport issues? Now, that's not quality and value of the product. And if you take that to its logical conclusion, you should have differential prices for all, all your producers, depending on how far they are from their point of uh, delivery to creameries and all the rest of it. Because if it's a principle that holds good for Butte, it must hold good for everybody. It's not a principle I would agree with, but it's not a quality and value issue. It's purely a transport issue. No, I, I think value in terms of the value that's delivered uh, from, from that particular farm. The, the way that this work was done uh, was it was uh, backwards from the customer through down to depot to farm level. So there was a very complicated spreadsheet um, that had all of our collection depots, all of our customers and all of our farmers. And, and that uh, approach was consistent across the country. But so in response to your question, yes, it did take into account del delivery mileage, you know, to, to each depot. Uh, and uh, so, so yes, I mean, when we when we've seen value, it was returns minus cost of, of, of delivery. So, so that was part of the whole. Uh, now, you could take it to the ultimate conclusion where it, you take it down to every farm level, but you have to stop somewhere, and that we stopped at depot level, and, and that was how we worked it out. But, but again, maybe to get back to the point that Claudia Beamish was, was raising about uh, the principles of, of a co-op, if they're going to mean anything, then something like transport costs are a really good example of something that should be equalised and absorbed across the, the whole organisation. I think you'll find even green co-ops, you know, distance to, to, the, to the, the mill, and for example, uh, are just part of, of the ongoing business, you know, that's taken into account. And, uh, maybe we're just catching up a bit on that. No. Sarah Boyer. Yeah, I'd like to follow up um, both my first question about price and Claudia Beamish's comments about um, the company's a cooperative. If we were to go into stores and buy first milk, milk, would we know it was your milk and would we know it's produced by a cooperative? Or is it branded with other companies? Uh, yeah, so... Part of our part of our business does go through uh, brands, so products coming out of the Glenfield uh, Creamery under Lake District brand, for instance, are Quark products, which are very good. Uh, I'd encourage people to buy them. Um, are available in in retail. A lot of our other product, particularly in cheese, uh, goes through a, a business partner of ours, which is the Irish Dairy Board. We have a strategic partnership with them, and they're marketed under our own brands um, by them, and also under their brands. So yeah. we don't actually sell milk per se, you know, we don't have a liquid offering. Uh, we, You're just supplying it to other people it who will move it. Because yeah. it goes back to your point about value and about what consumers are prepared to pay. Mm. If you look at the whole debate about fair trade movement, people pay a premium, and the issue about sourcing locally, people aren't necessarily paying more, but they are paying for a particular product. So there's clearly an issue about the value of what you're producing as a cooperative, because you've got lots of farmers banded together trying to make their own... Business. It's just an observation from somebody who either buys cooperative milk, which is presumably somewhere on this list of prices, um, um, but, or I buy from two different farms. And when I go to the shop, I have a choice of which of the two local farms I buy from. Um, so as a consumer, um, not really having an option to buy first milk here, am I? So it's just a, an observation about going forward about the value of the product which is partly about your brand and about the farmers that produce it. But, you know, nobody knows it's coming from Butte or yeah. all the different this farms. Is, this is part of the conversation we had. Uh, we, had this, we had meetings on Kintyre and Butte, as I said, and I think, to your point, these were truly cooperative meetings. These were the whole local community there looking at real P&Ls and talking about how we developed our business together. Um, that was a, a, a key topic of the discussion because if you're making milk on Butte, the reality is that consumers are willing to pay for a premium provenance product you know this is very high quality milk and people are willing to pay for it either as milk or in a uh, an, in another format uh, and so clearly we discussed that as a, a, a possibility for us as a business and we need to move that forward uh, claudia beamish thank you convener i'd like to just explore a little bit more about the um, equity issue and and cooperatives i'm obviously aware of the the big challenges and and the and the review the the miners review that you you highlighted i i still am a bit perplexed by um how some of the comments you've made today and my understanding of the situation actually fits with the 
cooperative ethos. I mean, if, if you, you're talking about the commercial value of milk, obviously you have to be a business and you are a business or you're going to go down like any other business, um, although they need support at, at some times. Um, but is it, is it really the case that uh, there's the mutual support that I would expect to see within the, uh, a cooperative business uh, when, when you're talking, um, Mike, about the volatility that can change one month and another month in a different area of, of Scotland or the UK and um, changes in value and niche markets and all that, I, I would expect to see, you know, I'm not in any way suggesting how you run the business yeah. going forward, but I would expect to see more, if I may say so, of an ethos of mutual support and sharing of risk. I I think the point I, I, I would build off, off that is, uh, you know, the guarantee of our, our, our ability to provide better support to our members, better prices and also better support, is predicated on our commercial success and financial success. And so the absence of that makes it very difficult to provide better levels of support to our, uh, our farmers. And so all of this boils down at the end in a very difficult market to um, being more commercially successful. Because, frankly, that gives us the resources to do a lot of, a lot of things uh, that I think we would like to do. I, th I think if you, if you look at Arla, uh, Arla have got a, a really extended pedigree of being a cooperative. You know, there's a huge amount of capital been built up in that business over generations and generations, and there, there's a real ethos behind it. And, all and, and they've got such a scale now that they can take do as you suggest, you know, and, and pay a, an even price across Europe, and, and that's great. We don't have that luxury at this moment in time. We're, we're in a business that's, you know, has its challenges. There's no, there's no point in pretending otherwise, and and, uh, uh, and you know, we don't have the, you know, that all that strength of capital behind us that, that they have. And, and I'd love to be able to do what I have done, and and you know, maybe in time we'll get there. But uh, at this moment in time, we have to deal with the realities as they are in front of us, and 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 get through, you know, and. Uh, and uh, and, and what about the ethos of which I'm suggesting of perhaps consideration of more mutual support between members when there's a, a, a difference between what what the commercial value is and and the transportation costs and and the volatility month by month that you're describing? I, I'd go Has back. I, I think I'd go back to the point. I mean, I, as I said, the um, is it James, the, um, the Scottish cooperative. Yeah, we, we, we discussed this, and he was, he was forceful in his point. He said this is not a principle of cooperatives, that people, it is very common to pay on the value. Uh, now, clearly, it would be an alternative approach to pay everybody the same. Um, we haven't had that before in our, our business, and it's not our intent, our intent going forward. So I do understand the point, and some cooperatives could choose to do it that way, but um, it's not been our, our approach, and it won't, be, it won't be going forward. All right, thank you. Um, Mike Russell. Yeah, um, if, if we could, and I know you want to focus on the future, um, and I think a lot of this has been about the future, what do you think this committee, the government, Scotland, should do to support the producers and yourselves going forward? Uh, I mean, apart from getting out of your way and letting you get on with what you want to do, which I suspect might be Mike's initial reaction, <laughs> um, a, the, the, the question would be, what do you think you now need? And what predictions can you make, if you can make any, but where you think the situation will be in the next year to 18 months for all your Scottish fields, but also you know, for your company? questions there. Um, first, I make a point that I think this is entirely helpful. So th this conversation, the conversation I had with uh, Richard, allows us to uh, work together more effectively and galvanise all the stakeholders uh, to deliver for the farmers. And that has to be our priority, um, getting a better outcome for our farmers. And we cannot do that, do that alone. Uh, to your point around uh, predictions, of course, I think that's predicated on prices and what's happening in the industry. I don't have a, a crystal ball. What I do have is we have a plan uh, to work on the things that we are within our control. And, and I think we've explained those, which is we're going we're to get our costs down, we're going to operate more efficiently, we're going to engage our farmers with a clear line of sight about the different business units. And those different business units have different challenges, uh, very different challenges, and we need to address them. Um, and, you know, ultimately, that means earning our way in the world 
and um, getting a better commercial return for our milk in whatever format it, it's in. Um, I think what I, you know, what we need to do, and this is what I committed, I committed it uh, to you, I've committed it to the farmers, um, we've committed as a board uh, to Richard, is that we will develop some very clear business plans and say, in order to, to become the international business that we want to be, branded business, this is where we're going to be. And this time, we're going to say year one, year two, year three, the building blocks of that, because businesses are, are not built overnight. Um, and we'll be very specific about the help we want as well. People, don't, you know, people have to live with insecurity, they have to live with, with doubt, but uh, there's been an awful lot of this in here. I think, you know, speaking insofar as I can for my constituents to engage in this business. What they want to hear from you, I think, is that First Milk believes that it has a future in Kintyre and Butte and is going to work very hard to make sure that that future does exist for the company and for the producers. Can you give them that assurance today? Uh, I can tell you, uh, so I can't give any guarantees about what the market's going to look like in a, in a year or two. Uh, what I can say, if I put my, my marketing hat on and I leverage some of my international experience, that Kintyre and Butte uh, and Aaron have a fantastic product which consumers want both here in Scotland and, ar and around the world. Our task is to deliver that uh, uh, as quickly as we are in, right, in the right way, under the right brands, with the right route to market uh, at a premium price. So we have a fantastic asset. We have consumers that want that product here and around the world. Our job is to, to build that uh, bridge. Personally, I think it's, it's doable and that we must do it in the, in the coming years. Thank you. That's helpful. I uh, bought some mull of Kintyre cheddar in uh, Sainsbury's a couple of nights ago. Um, I'm aware, obviously, that uh, the Scottish dairy brand is going to be launched at the Royal Highland Show. Uh, the thing that attracts me is that I know I can get a local product and that uh, it's branded in that fashion. And uh, it's one amongst many, and unfortunately in the shops I go into, the promotion of Scottish brands have not been... Uh, beneficial I think yet for uh, what is uh, a good product as you say <laughs> do you think really in the end that uh, uh, the production of uh, cheese for example in Campbellton, in Arran etc actually needs to be part of the cooperative structure that you've got to win that niche market does it need to be part of it? Yeah. Clearly, you know, I would want it to be part of, uh, of First Milk. Clearly, that, uh, you know, that business model could succeed in different, in, in different ways. Uh, but our intent is to make it successful as, a, as an organisation. Having said that, you know, uh, as we do the strategy review, we're open to all, uh, all options that are in the best interest of our, our farmers. This is a cooperative, and whatever is in the best interest of the farmers uh, will be the best outcome for First Milk. Are you trying to expand the cooperative to have more farmers in it? No, not currently. So uh, I, 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 I'll make a point around this: is that one of the because we we haven't really talked much about the the the, the, the reasons behind the strategy of having our milk pools structured in a different way. But as we have aligned our farmers to our creameries, uh, one of the things we need to do over time is concentrate um, our milk fields, make them more efficient. Um, reduce our logistics costs and build the connection between those farmers and the creameries more clearly. Uh, as we see expansion opportunities in Campbelltown, so as, if you saw us uh, essentially increasing the tonnage coming out of that, clearly we would need more, more milk. So in changing this way of working, we've enabled that by giving a, an organisation that's very clear uh, with, with milk fields associated with creamery. So that's the thinking behind it. So to the extent that we would say now we want to expand this and recruit people, it enables us to start recruiting. It's been very difficult for us as a business to recruit farmers. I think that's quite, quite well known. Uh, essentially, we've inherited farmers across the country, um, and we haven't been able to, like many commercial organisations, go out and recruit farmers as effectively as other organisations. On this point, or a similar one, Sarah Boyack? Just the conveners prompted me to think what the contribution of Cooperative Development Scotland has been in terms of being of assistance moving forward, because you've obviously got Scottish Year of Food and Drink. Um, the cooperative issue at the local level is quite important, and it's obviously the ethos of the company, and there's clearly lots of lessons to be learned from what's gone before. But there's, the, there's your organisation, but there's also promoting cooperatives in the farming world. It, it's got to be more than just a, a good aspiration. There's some real business issues, and it seems to me Cooperative Development Scotland either needs to be learning from that or helping you move forward. 
Well, I mean, the SEOS have a, had a big role to play in, uh, and, and, and continue to do. You know, in terms of the working group we have in Campbelltown, uh, there's, there's two members of SOS sitting in that, uh, and uh, so, so yeah, they've, they've been a big help. Um, they were involved in the scenario plan exercise, which I think is kind of what you're alluding to in terms of other potential models out there. So, so no, I mean, we take take help wherever we can find it, and they, we find SOS are a, a, a great organisation. Okay, um, Alec. Uh Thank you. Um, thank you, convener. Uh, my, my, my question is on a slightly different tack, but it's prompted by something that Mike said earlier, w w quite rightly, in pointing out that as a cooperative, your producer members have a stake in the company. Um, I represent Galloway in southwest of Scotland, which is a, a hotbed of dairy production, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, and over the years, uh, as is almost inevitable in this field, um, a number of members of First Milk have moved on uh, and left First Milk, handed in their notice for their contract, and moved to, to other processes, whatever it might be. Um, as part of that contract, they, are required, they were required to leave their capital investment in the company for five years. Um, some of my constituents came to me this year. They were due to be paid out on the 1st of April, I believe. Some quite significant sums of money. Um, and for, I guess, understandable reasons, First Milk has... Uh, opted to um, to utilize its right, as I understand, under the terms of the contract, to delay payment, delay repayment of the capital, um, which they would get nothing this year, I think, uh, and a proportion over the next three years. Um, I, 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 I just want to know, and I think this may be difficult for you, what guarantee is there that they will get their repayment over the next three years? Um, and does the company have the ability to, to further extend the period of that repayment if it's financially necessary to do so? And can I also ask, if you're able to tell me, what sort of size this total burden of debt, if I can call it that, is on First Milk as a company? The issue you're talking about, you know, as you well know, we deferred payment on our members. Uh, we asked them to contribute more capital to the business. Uh, and we were getting a fair bit of heat from them in terms of, look, we're paying more capital and these guys are taking the capital out of the business. So, you know, it was a hole in the bucket, as it were. And uh, so it was a no-brainer in terms of the board, you know, to, to do that. Um, yeah, we can't give any guarantees with capital. You know, we can't give any guarantees with the members' capital or, you know, it's, it's part of the, the ongoing capital of the business and, and you know, it is... It's, um, it's a substantial sum. I, I can't remember offhand just exactly, you know, what the, the figure is, but it, it's a substantial sum. Um, but, you know, we we just it's just one of these issues that we, we have to work with as a co-op. Other co-ops don't pay out. If you were in Arla, for example, you you wouldn't get your full capital out of the business. You only you, you leave a percentage, but I think it's roughly about thirty percent of the capital. And the business is just one of the ongoing things. The capital structure that we as a board have inherited says that we will pay out in full. And when a business is shrinking, that that creates a challenge for us. There's, there's no, you know, and there's no one going to duck that issue as, a, as an issue for the business. And, uh, but it is what it is, and we just we have to deal with it. But it, but it would remain your intention. Yes. Oh, yeah. The intention. All, all things then, being well, to yes. Oh, no question. Yeah. Yeah. To absolutely. repay on the terms that were agreed this year, or yes. that were notified yeah. this year to these people. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that's intention. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I think uh, we've reached a point where, um, you know, we're looking for a way forward. We've had some indications of that from you. Um, we aren't entirely happy with uh, the understanding, I think, of uh, the various elements of where you're trying to retain capital in the business through the retention money, through the deferred payments, etc. And we understand, obviously, why that is. But, uh, you know, I think we need to know from you uh, what commitment there is by First Milk to make sure that there's actually going to be a Scottish arm of this uh, in the way forward. Because although there's variety within that, uh, and you've inherited uh, businesses to, to give you milk, uh, you know, um, there must be some clarity from the point of view of people out there that they believe that First Milk is going to be able to deliver uh, in the next period of time. We can't predict long into the future, but we're left wondering seriously whether First Milk is going to be a going concern for Scottish farmers in this next two or three years? Uh, uh, we've, had, we've had conversations across the country with different farmers explaining the market conditions 
and the turnaround plan that we've we've got. You know, if uh, First Milk is going to be successful, it will be successful because we all work together in what is a very very challenging market market context. And I think it is, um, you know, the, the request I've got is that all of us work together for that uh, outcome for the farmers. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mike Gallagher and Jim Baird, both of you, uh, for enlightening us so far in this. I think we'll need to speak to you again sometime soon once we see how this starts to pan out because we have a particular responsibility to make sure that uh, there is a future for Scottish dairy produce. And if it's, as you say, something that uh, is demanded by customers, then we won't see how best to deliver that. Um, so thank you for your evidence. Uh, and that will conclude our meeting today. Uh, just to tell everybody that at the next meeting of the committee, well, it concludes the, the public part of the meeting today, um, at our next meeting uh, on the 3rd of June, we'll consider three pieces of subordinate legislation, take evidence on the implementation of the CAP application IT system for, from stakeholders, and we will also further consider petition PE 01547 on the conservation of wild salmon. And we now move into private. Uh, as agreed earlier, I close the public part of the meeting and request the public gallery <coughs> to be cleared.